Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for coming out this evening. Um, our first speaker is going to be Father Rene Havaliana, and uh, I've just had the pleasure of meeting him for the first time this evening. I hope that this will be the beginning of a long uh, colleagueship and friendship as well. Um, he is a uh, associate professor in the fine arts program at the, in the School of Humanities at Ateneo de Manila uh, University in Manila, of course. Uh, he has a very uh, long and distinguished record of accomplishments in, as an artist, as a scholar, as a teacher, as a leader in the Philippine art scene, and I just wanted to give you a few uh, highlights. Uh, I should also say that, uh, that he's no stranger to the Bay Area because in, the, um, uh, in earlier decades he was a graduate student and I think did a PhD at, um, at in uh, the interdisciplinary fields of religion and the arts at the Pacific School of Religion, the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. So uh, welcome back again to the Bay Area. Um, as I mentioned, um, uh, Father Rene is uh, an artist himself. He actually studied at the uh, famous Art Students League in, uh, in New York in the 1980s. Um, I look forward to learning more about your own artworks. It'll be great to, uh, to see more and learn more. Um, he's written a very large and impressive number of both scholarly and uh, popular works, and I won't list them all, but just take my word for it that it's truly a very, very impressive list. And just one last thing I wanted to mention, because this is uh, close to the hearts of many people, I'm sure everyone in the audience and everyone who's involved in the Asian Art Museum, and that is that he has been an advocate for the conservation of cultural heritage in the Philippines and has been very um, active as a speaker and organizer and supporter of the conservation of heritage, something very important to our hearts. So uh, please join me in welcoming Father Rene Havaliana. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Forrest. And thank you all for uh, joining Cora and myself and Father Lucas in this evening, because in a way our talk today is an advertisement for you to please go and visit the current show going on at the University of San Francisco. So my talk today will be about uh, art in colonial Philippines. And uh, I begin with this uh, image uh, uh, to my left. You will see an, an, a, a bas relief of a galleon, which this uh, bas relief is carved on the door of a church in, uh, in the Philippines. It symbolizes the importance of the galleon as a uh, way that linked together three continents, Asia, and through Mexico, uh, the Americas, and Europe, uh, Spain. I'm giving this talk as a way of introduction to the ongoing show, Galleon and Globalization, California Mission Arts and the Pacific Rim at the University of San Francisco Thatcher Gallery. And the show will continue all the way up to the 17th of December. There's also a concurrent exhibit, uh, The Legacies of the Book, uh, er Early Missionary Printing in Asia and the Americas. And I just attended a very um, uh, enlightening uh, a conference on the legacies of the book at the From Hall at the University of San Francisco. Both exhibitions point to the role of trade and communication as a media for cultural diffusion and exchange. This is the uh, teaser that you find in the website of, of the University of San Francisco for the, for the show Galleons and Globalization. I'd like to begin with this fact about the California mission, which some people know, but most people maybe don't know all about it. Fray Benito Cambon, who together with Father Palu founded Mission Dolores here in San Francisco, went to Manila to procure supplies for the California missions, specifically for the Mission Dolores. Now he found a way to go there, cheap, without paying a, a fare. He volunteered to become the chaplain of the frigate La Princesa and left for Manila in 1780. And then he returned in 1781 as a chaplain of another ship, the San Carlos. 
Returning home, he brought some 20 plus crates and bales of goods from Manila. Among them, the very famous tabernacle at Mission Dolores, which unfortunately is not there at the moment because it is a USF. Side by side with another tabernacle from the Philippines, carved around the same era. Father Cambon fell ill because of this long trip across the Pacific, and so he had to disembark at San Diego. But since the cargo has destined for the naval station of San Blas, government bureaucracy didn't use its head. They sent all the cargo to San Blas, and it sat there in customs for two years. It was not until the year 1783 that finally the cargo arrived at Alta, California. Talk of government efficiency. The title of my talk is Growing Roots, Christian Art in Colonial Philippines. I'm drawing here an analogy from agriculture, the idea of, of the seed, an image that is found in the Gospels when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God. Uh, in the Spanish era, it was interpreted in a very concrete uh, form as Catholicism. Catholicism had to be sown and had to be brought. Christianity, in, in many ways, is a foreign intrusion into Asia. It was an imported seed brought to the Philippines and Asia. Of course, there's some scholarly uh, discussion now that Christianity arrived a little earlier in the form of the Nestorians of China, but uh, uh, that, that, that's another story. Here are some important dates when we think of the Philippines, just, just to situate us. Uh, regarding the introduction of Christianity. The first and important date is 1521 and 1565. 1521 is the year when Magellan arrives in the Philippines. And um, he goes there not so much to establish a colony, but to find a route that will bring the Spanish ships to Asia without crossing the, the route that was now monopolized by Portugal, passing through Africa, through India, through Malacca, and so forth. So it wasn't a colonizing trip at all, it was exploratory. The next important date is 1565, when in April, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, with a very learned Augustinian uh, friar, who was his uh, navigator and, uh, and cosmographer, Andres Ordoneta, arrived in the Philippines. Ordoneta is a very important person in the history of the Philippines because it was he who postulated the theory that if there was a current, that uh, a gyre, a current that uh, moved around the Atlantic Ocean from Europe to the New World and then from the, from the New World back to Europe, there was probably something similar that connected the uh, Asia with the American, uh, uh, the, we the West Coast of the, of, of, of the Americas. And it was Ordoneta who discovered this, uh, this, uh, this uh, current. Uh, he uh, created what the Spanish call the torna viaje, the return trip. The return trip made it possible that from the years 1565 to 1815, there was an annual uh, expedition or, or trips of boats that shipped goods from Asia to the Americas and through the Americas, ultimately to Spain. And then that brought from the Americas silver, clergymen, soldiers, civil officials, and other uh, trappings of Western civilization to the Philippines and from there to be diffused to the rest of Asia. Colonization meant that the Philippines entered into a triangular economic relationship with China and Mexico. Manila served as the Asian entrepo of the Spanish Pacific trade. It was actually in Manila where the goods that uh, were shipped through the Galleon and arrived fr uh, fr from Mexico were brokered. The Philippines was where Asian art was exported to the Americas. It was, it was here really where the Asian art export to the Americas where work was created. Manila, in Manila, goods were sold, exchanged, packaged, and shipped to Mexico, and then, up, and then, from, uh, and then things, things from Mexico also got unloaded. The Philippines was the Spanish center, then, uh, uh, where, where Christian art was created, and specifically, we have identified these two, two districts very near uh, within Manila now, 
uh, known as Binondo, Santa Cruz, Quiapo, and the ever-shifting Parian, or the Chinese market in the Philippines. There were other Asian centers that created Christian art, namely Macau, which is under the Portuguese, and very briefly Nagasaki, where the Jesuits had a short-lived art workshop and academy. That workshop, of course, closed uh, during the persecution of the Christians under the Tokugawa shogunate. So just to see those, those three important points where, where art developed there to, to, the, uh, to the very uh, top uh, with an arrow. This is, this is from Google Maps. Uh, uh, that's Nagasaki. And then there's Macau in the center in the Philippines uh, way below. Now, how was this trade possible? How was this exchange possible? Well, there was, at, at that time, in the, in the 16th century, I, what I call a revolution in co transportation and communication. The revolution was the uh, perfection of European ships that were able to survive the travel across the oceans. Um, the first type of ocean-going vessel used by Columbus and also by Magellan was known as the Caravel. These were not really cargo ships, they were really more exploratory ships. The Galleon, however, was a cargo ship. It is known as the Nau. It is a Portuguese term, but it was also used by the Spaniards. Uh, the Nau got uh, bigger and bigger as, as, as uh, more and more cargo was, uh, was loaded onto it, uh, so, that, uh, so that the Nau would average some about 150 feet long or some even longer. Uh, so this was, this was the, the transportation revolution. There was also a communications revolution that was going on. And this had to do with, in a sense, the obsession of the Spanish crown, especially during the kingship of Philip II, to have reports written, sent in duplicate, sometimes in triplicate form to Spain. So there was, you might say, an almost obsessive uh, letter writing and personal and official correspondence going on. Among the religious orders, like the Jesuits or the Dominicans, the Augustinians and the Franciscans, the first four that evangelized the Philippines, it was the duty of the provincial superior to send an annual letter, which was a summary of everything that happened uh, during, uh, during a particular given year, and copies of these letters were sent to the mother house in Spain, and another copy, if they had a house in Rome, was also sent to Rome. There are also reports and histories known by different names, Relacion, Cronicas, Historia, and then responses to questions sent by the Spanish crown through the Consejo de las Indias. Another revolution that occurred, a communications revolution that occurred around this era, was the introduction of that, the press, starting with the presses using uh, wood blocks or the silographic press. By the early 17th century, the press had, had started using the movable type or the typographic press. This is a um, sketch of an owl uh, from Portuguese sources. You, you, ca you can see that the, the bottom of the ship is quite large, that's, that's, uh, so, so that it can contain a lot of cargo. And this is the trading route. The, the white route represents the, the Spanish uh, route. Uh, it, leaving Manila, the, the galleon would, would move up to roughly the, uh, where Japan is and make a crossing across the Pacific. Uh, it's the first landfall it would see would be roughly around Mendocino in the California coast. And then it would inch slowly down through Baja California, uh, rest for a while at the uh, San Blas Naval Station, finally arrive in Acapulco. From there, from Acapulco, goods were... Um, downloaded, uh, and then the cargo went by uh, mule pack across to Veracruz. From Veracruz, then ships would bring the cargo to Havana, and then from Havana, another ship would bring it all the way to Seville. From Seville, the, the return trip was, was the other way around. Although from Acapulco, the ship sailed lower than, than the, than, uh, than the uh, um, then, then the trip come, uh, coming from Manila going to Acapulco, this all had to do with water currents and, uh, and, uh, and, the, and uh, winds. Uh, the ship returning back to Manila would pass by today the islands that we call Guam. Uh, so this was, this, was the, this, was the, this was the route. Sometimes the galleon went as far as Lima in Peru. So there is a Peruvian connection to, to this whole story of, of the galleons. 
who are the principal actors or people involved then in the, in the creation and the diffusion uh, of, of Christian art and its, its uh, development and rise in the Philippines? Well, you have basically three groups of people. Very important are the Spanish, but in particular the Spanish friars and missionaries. Secondly, the indigenous peoples of the Philippines, which, we, which Spaniards tend to divide into two groups, the Indios Moros, those who, who had embraced Islam, and the Indios Paganos, those who did not. And then Chinese artisans. These missionaries who came to the Philippines were a very unusual lot, and one of the things that characterized them was their deep conviction that they were on a mission to do God's work. They came from a context of the Catholic Reformation in Spain, where religious figures like cardinals and the mystics were in the forefront of returning Spain back, in a sense, to the most profound and the purest practice of Catholicism. You had people like Cardinal Cisneros, who was the personal confessor of Queen Isabel I, the founder of the Jesuit order, Ignatius of Loyola, and mystics as Santa, Santa Teresa of Avila and San Juan de la Cruz. There was also that spirit with, uh, which you might call the Reconquista spirit because in 1492, the same year that Columbus um, arrived in the Americas, the Moorish kingdom of Granada fell into the arms of uh, King Ferdinand and Isabella. And they started their own consolidation of, of, of the rule all over Spain. Another characteristic of the missionaries that came to the Philippines is, is that they learned from the Mexican experience. The Mexican experience of colonization, evangelization in the Philippines have often been compared. It has been noted in the Philippines there was less people who died. There was le it was less bloody. There was, there's less records of population uh, decimation. It is also said that in Mexico, one of the reasons for the decimation of the, of the Indian population was the fact that the Indians were not immune to the diseases uh, brought by the Spaniards. The Philippines, however, was in a very different situation. The reason why Spain chose it to Manila, especially to be the entry pool for their trade, was that the Philippines has always been in the crossroads of trades in, in Southeast Asia. I think from as early as the ninth century of the Common Era, there is evidence already of an active trade with China. There's always been an active trade too with Japan, active trade with India, and all the way as far as Oman in, in Saudi Arabia. So uh, the Filipino people were exposed most likely to all sorts of, of diseases. So there's, there are no great records of, of people getting sick. There's also the fact that the Philippines is, a, is a, 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 an archipelago of islands, so disease could not easily hop from one island to the other. So then, all told, then the Christianization of the Philippines was, was systematic and effective, and yes, less bloody than Mexico. The other important thing, too, to remember is the institution called the Patronato Real. This is a unique situation where the Spanish crown and the Catholic Church were very close partners in, in the one task of evangelization and colonization. So different from the American tradition of the separation of church and state. During the years of Spanish rule, in a sense, church and state were one. Oh yes, sometimes the bishop and the archbishops quarreled with the governors and the governors general, but most of the time they were in harmony. They, they tried as much as possible to, to work hand in hand with each other. In fact, it was the Spanish crown that paid for the evangelization of the Philippines, taking, taking upon itself the responsibility of bringing in missionaries uh, to the Philippines and then supporting them with what began in the beginning with, a, with an annual, um, an annual uh, subsidy of 100 rials and 100 fanegas or bushels of rice. Here's just uh, pictures of these great reformers, Cardinal Cisneros and St. Ignatius, uh, as portrayed in his death mask. What about the peoples that they found? Well, they called them Indio. This is just a generic term used by the Spaniards to designate the indigenous peoples, whether they found them in, in the Americas or they found them uh, in Asia. Indios simply meant that they, they lived in the East. Well, they lived in the Indies. That's why they were called Indios. Moro, on the other hand, was a term that was already used in Spain during the Conquista, and its derivative is eventually from the Latin Maurus, and it refers to the, the people who, uh, uh, the Islamic people who came from North Africa and entered into Spain. 
And the term was applied by the Spaniards to all the, the Muslims they encountered, whatever their ethnicity was. Now, Islam came to the Philippines in the 13th century, brought by Arab traders, but who dealt mostly with communities in the south. And Islam was in the process of spreading north when the Spaniards arrived. Today, there's a big divide in the Philippines between the southern part of the island of Mindanao, which is, which is very Islamic, and the rest of the country, which is very Christian. And that is a direct result of the, of the, of the coming of the Spaniards in the 16th century. It stopped the spread of Islam northwards. The Spanish missionaries were less successful with the Moros. They could not convert them. So they spent most of their time rather with the Paganos because the other tribes who were mostly animistic were not very well organized. And they found that animism was not antagonistic to Christianity. Um, it was very easy to reorient the Islamic belief in spirits to uh, Catholic religious practices, but it was quite difficult to, to tell the uh, Muslims that Allah and God the Father were one and the same. So the Spanish missionaries, we might say, were involved in, in terms of spreading Christianity to the Philippines in a process that has actually a very long tradition in, in, in Christianity of reorienting orient, uh, pre-existing pagan practices to become Christian, to become Catholic, if you want it that way. In a sense, they baptized paganism. So if today in the Philippines there's a, uh, there's a great love for saints and feasts of saints, uh, behind that also probably is still a lingering uh, love and belief of your ancestral spirits or your local spirits. The Chinese. The Chinese played a dominant role at least in the beginning of the development of Christian art. In 1588, the Bishop of Manila, Domingo de Salazar, in his, uh, an account written to King Philip, uh, or called the Relacion, talks about the Chinese and what they were engaged in. And here's just a quotation. Of the Chinese, he wrote, within the silk market, which we, which we call the Parian, there are many tailors, cobblers, bakers, carpenters, candle makers, confectioners, apothecaries, painters, silversmiths, and those engaged in other occupations. It was to these carpenters, candle makers, and so forth that the Spanish would turn when they began building in the European tradition and having paintings and sculpture made in the European manner. It was also to the same Chinese that they turned for the act of, a task of printing. Why did they turn to the Chinese artisans? Well, for one, we now know that, there were, well, that the Chinese are very enterprising. When they knew that there was a market being opened in Manila, there are records, and recent studies of it have been made, of uh, the Chinese deliberately going to the Philippines to, to, to become carpenters, to become stonemasons, to become carvers. They were also uh, served as traders and middlemen. And uh, at least in the 16th and the early 17th century, there was a great dream among many of the missionary orders that the Philippines would serve like a, just a stepping point to get from the Philippines into China. This is the great Chinese dream. They did not quite succeed. What was more successful was the group of Matteo Ricci that started from Macau. So they probably also saw that working with the Chinese was a pathway to conversion. Uh, and it is known that Juan Vera, that is, his, uh, that is his Christian name, was actually a Chinese. And he printed the very first book using a movable metal type in 1602. The book is entitled Las Excelencias de Santissimo Rosario. By the mid-17th century, however, the Chinese seemed to play less and less of a role in the creation of art. But probably their, their disappearance has to do not so much that they were not around, but rather that the Chinese began to marry into the local population. For the Chinese that came to the Philippines were mostly men. So you had a whole colony of, of men, who had, they had no wives, so they married to the local uh, uh, population. Then arose a generation of half-breeds, or Mesiso Chinos, their children. And to these children, they passed on the skills of, of carving, of sculpture, of painting, and so forth. Because of the active trade with China, and, and even in although Macau was under the Portuguese, there was a relationship still with Macau. After all, it was, it, Macau was still, the Portuguese were still Catholics, so the Spanish were also Catholics. Uh, in fact, some of the early pieces in the Philippines of colonial art did not come from the Philippines. 
A very good example of that are the choir stalls in the, uh, the oldest standing church in the Philippines, the Church of St. Augustine, completed in the year 1607. So when the Augustinians wanted some furniture for their choir, it was easier just to order it from Macau. So, it, so it's still there. The traffic in goods between mainland China and the Philippines increased during the colonial era, and one of those important commodities was silk, and as we will see also later, ivory. The, ch the marketplace, uh, or, or called the Parian, uh, was constantly changing depending upon the history, and here are just some of the sites. It was first within the perimeter of Intramuros, which was the Spanish enclave, then immediately outside the walls, when the walls was built in 1595, and then push farther away after the, 19th and the 1630s Chinese uprising, and then moved on to different places until finally it ended up across the river uh, because, uh, uh, because the Spanish were, const were constantly afraid that although they needed the Chinese for trade, they were not always so sure of how loyal they were to the Spanish crown. Teachers. The great teachers of art were the friars. And we do have some of, some of them on record. It is known, for example, that Father Antonio Sedeño, he was the first mission superior of the, of, the, of the Jesuits in the Philippines. He wrote to the general at, at Rome, Claudio Acquaviva. He said, please send us some Italian brothers who can teach our people here how to paint. And he himself is recorded by the, the historian of the Philippines, uh, Jesuits, Pedro Quirino. It says that he taught the Chinese masons and carpenters the rudiments of European architecture. And he's also known to have set up a painting studio. The Augustinians, likewise, were known to have had their own studio, and the, the Dominicans were one of the pioneers in printing, uh, having been responsible for the publication of the first printed book in the Philippines, the Doctrina Christiana, in, in, in the native language Tagalog, and another Doctrina in, in, uh, in Chinese. And this was quite early in the year 1593. So for so many years, or centuries in fact, religious themes dominated the uh, art of the Philippines. Secular themes came only around the 19th century when we begin to see family portraits and the like. The Synod of Manila was very important in setting the tone of this relationship between the native population and, and how to deal with them. Uh, it was convened by Bishop Domingo de Salazar, who himself was a disciple of the great Bartolomé de las Casas. It's, uh, although it's called the Synod of 1582, the Synod, in fact, continued on and off until the following year. And here are some of the questions that it tried to, to solve. Now, very important in this, in this Synod was some decisions that they made. Among them was that the language of evangelization should be in the native vernacular rather than in Spanish. It was more practical for a handful of missionaries to learn the many languages of the Philippines than to first teach the Filipinos how to speak Spanish and then to teach them the faith. That, that, that there were not enough teachers to go around. So, and early on it was realized that the printing press was a very important means of um, the disseminating information and communication. They also, the Synod also decided to work very closely with the indigenous social structure and the native elite was appointed to positions of responsibility. Um, the civil government appointed Governor or like uh, a, a village ch uh, chief. Okay. In the church, the two most important uh, uh, lay, per lay uh, position was the fiscal in the sacristan. The fiscal was the person in charge of keeping church records, and the sacristan held the key to the sacristy of the church, in other words, to the, to, to, the, to the goods of the church. So it's a very important position. And most important is they met people where they, where they were. When we look at the work of the uh, Spanish missionaries, we saw how much they used imagination and emotion more than logic and, and, the, and the sensual, more than discursive thinking to spread the faith. This is one of the very early uh, arte, or grammars uh, done by the Spanish. It was printed in the Philippines in 1610 in the uh, Dominican mission of Bataan by Tomas Pinpin, who was a native uh, of the Philippines. Some say he probably had Chinese ancestry. The, the name sounds Chinese. This is the work also of Pinpin, and, 
And this time, this is, a, this is a, a, the vocabulary of a, a, a Fray San Buenaventura and a, a, a Franciscan um, missionary. The other thing also that they did was, aside from adapting themselves to the native culture, there was also a reorientation of the native culture. An important element which made possible in the teaching of art was the creation of the reduction. This was a policy of settling people into compact villages. The villages were laid out following the best concepts of the Renaissance. They followed the grid. The structures built in the Renaissance first started as temporary structures built in the vernacular idiom, that is, they were of wood, bamboo, and thatch. But then they began to be replaced by more permanent architecture beginning in the late 16th century. Once stable and organized, the reduction could then apply to, become, to the status of a pueblo or a town or even higher, a villa. And more, uh, Ciudad was a little bit more difficult. The city was, uh, was rarely given. The typical Philippine town plan brought by the Spaniards has really its origins in, in classical Rome, where the towns were laid out, organized as a grid, following two important streets, the Cardo, which run north and south. It was the main road in classical town planning. And the Decomenos, which, is, uh, which run east and west. It was refined further by Renaissance theoreticians and urban planners, and implemented extensively in the Spanish colonies in the Americas and Asia. By way of footnote, the Portuguese plan in their colonies was somewhat different from, from, the, from, the, from the Spanish because the plan was anchored on vistas. So if you go to Macau, which is a Portuguese settlement, you find out that the most important buildings of Macau are on hilltops. So quite different from the, from the, the Spanish concept. So the main road in the Spanish town was known as the Car, uh, Calle Real. This corresponded to the Cardo of the, of the Roman classical plan. And the secondary street, uh, which corresponded to the Comenos, this was often the commercial road. And this is also where the market was located. And all other streets were parallel to these main streets. And so you had this wonderful rhythm of built space and open spaces uh, and, and streets crisscrossing each other in a neat grid. Here is a very, very early drawing of Intramuros, the Spanish settlement of Manila with the wall in it. This particular, this particular painting is found inside the lid of a trunk that was used to transport goods uh, uh, across the Pacific to Mexico. The, the, um, the, is present, uh, the trunk is at, at present in the Franz Mayer Museum in Mexico City. And it shows you uh, the city laid out as a grid. And there at the lower right-hand corner, enclosed in their own little wall, is the Parian, or the Chinese market. And separated from the rest of the city by uh, water by a moat. Here is a uh, schematic of the, of the uh, uh, city of Manila. And it shows you the two main roads, Casa Real del Palacio. It is now known as General Luna. And then crossing it is the other uh, Calle Real de Parian. Okay, that, is, that is a secondary street. It is called Parian because to, at the very end of that street, up, up at its uh, top part, you, you end up in the Puerta del Parian, and there was the Chinese market. Here is the city of Cebu in 1730. Again, we can see very clearly the, the, um, the grid plan. Okay. And this is applied even to small towns. Here's the town of Pila in Laguna. The center of that town is, follows the grid. Uh, here's a detail of that town center, very, very neatly laid out. Okay. With the church dominating the whole, the whole town structure and an open space, a plaza, and around it the most important uh, buildings of a town. So this is the context in which art is made. It is really a context of not only just of you know, teaching art, but really of planning the life of people, of reorienting the life of people, of making um, out of Orientals uh, citizens of the Spanish Empire and bringing, to the, bringing across the Pacific concepts uh, of, of the leading town planners of Europe of the age. So there was a structure in that whole reduction. Uh, the ecclesiastic at the very top, of course, was the bishop of the diocese, then the parish priest or the missionary, then other church functionaries like the fiscal, the sacristan, and then below them, different other uh, groupings. There was a parallel with the government, where you have the governor general on top, the provincial governor, the alcalde, 
was uh, Spanish, uh, was Spanish, and then uh, like the pet, petty mayors, the governor Dorcillo, and below them on the level of the small clan village, the Cabezas de Barangay. We still use this term barangay today in the Philippines to refer to the smallest unit of, uh, of the political structure. Daily life was strongly regulated, uh, particularly in the, in the 17th century and up to about the mid-18th century. The church bell not only told the passage of time, but it also called people to common worship, to prayer. It announced also impending danger. Uh, while parents worked in the field, their children were all being catechized and taught the rudiments of reading and writing in the Catholic doctrine. Songs conveyed the essence of the catechism. Processions to and from the church were a daily occurrence. And festivals were enlightened, not just by religious ceremonies, but by popular didactic entertainment. The atrial cross, it was a cross right in front of the church, was a feature of colonial town planning and architecture. Hardly any, unfortunately, remain in the Philippines because of most of these crosses were just made of wood. What we do have remaining are just their stone bases, and, 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 very few, and much of them are very much degraded. Jesuit historian Pedro Morillo Velarde, writing in the 18th century, reports that in a typical town, children begin each day with a procession towards the atrial cross while singing the doctrina or the catechism. From there, they would go to school. And midday, there's another procession to the cross, and with that, ended morning class. So their life was really uh, centered around this, uh, um, around Christian, about religion. Okay. What about the arts? Well, what was happening in the arts at this, uh, this particular time served very well the needs of Catholicism. Because from the Renaissance to Baroque in the West, there was a growing confluence of all the arts. The arts were not seen as separate uh, expressions, but as one expression. And the urban plan, which the Spaniards brought to the Philippines, was the setting of all the arts. The church facade, in fact, served as a permanent backdrop for public uh, demonstrations, for celebrations, and even for, for theatrical pieces. And the plaza was this flexible gathering space for people. The church ceremony was very visual and very auditory. Uh, it, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, uh, it was it was spectacle, uh, writ large, you know, with the gold vestments and incense and, 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 uh, and candles and flowers and the ringing of bells. Um, the visual arts, therefore, of architecture, painting and sculpture, all of these things, the performing arts, music, theater, and pageant, all became one. The religious and didactic dramas were performed at the plazas and they complemented the rituals of the church. More often, these dramas were about the life of the saints. And later, a form called in the Philippines, Moro Moro, depicted the never-ending conflict between the Moors and the Christians. But the Moors and the Christians who are fighting in our, in, our, in our place were not the Moors and the Christians of Mindanao. They were Moors and Christians in Turkey and other parts of the Middle East. So, the fiesta was an annual opportunity to cement the bonds of community. Religious celebrations were not just only religious, they were civic uh, displays, they were times for entertainment, and of course, feasting and eating, which always seems to characterize any Filipino gathering. Here's a painting, modern painting today, of a fiesta, the Fiesta of Quiapo. I just, I just put it here. Just for somehow it depicts the kind of frenzy and, and, and life uh, of a Filipino fiesta where all these elements of celebration, drama, color come together. How were people taught about, about the arts? Well, there were models that came to, to the Philippines and prototypes, right? Uh, some of these important models are 1565, an image of the Christ child was discovered by a Spanish soldier when Legaspi's troops attacked the town of Cebu. They believed that this was the same image of the Christ child given by Magellan and, uh, and left in 1521. There's also in 1609 the Señor Nazareno, which we know came from Mexico, and the Inmaculada Concepcion in 1626 given to the Jesuits by Governor Nino de Tabora. We also know that in 1595, Pope Innocent IX sent large engravings to, the, to be distributed to the churches and to be used for worship. And there's also this recurrent trope or story that appears in the Philippines. It is a story of strange images that, that are found, okay? Like the Nuestra de Guía in Ermita, the Berhena Caisasia in Taal, the Nuestra Soledad de Portabaga in Cavite. 
This is the Santo Nino of Cebu, said to be the same image brought by Magellan. Very much loved. Uh, uh, the Santo Nino can, uh, can compete with Imelda Marcos in the number of clothes it has. Okay? It's literally thousands of, of, uh, of uh, changes of dress. This is, the, this is the, uh, 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 the Paula Virgin. It was so popular that you have a 19th century print of her. This is the Jesus Nazareno of Chiapo, a very old picture of it. Uh, actually, the real image of the, the Jesus Nazareno does not go in procession anymore. It is left inside the church because the procession has become so wild, the priests are afraid that this very old statue will not survive the mad rush of people trying to touch it. And this is the church of Chiapo. This is the virgin called Nuestra Señor de Guía, found in Manila in 1571. Uh, to the right are very rare photographs of the, of the virgin, minus all that finery. Uh, it was taken when the image was restored in the 1970s, and the, the paint had uh, really uh, become deteriorated. The story goes that this image was found by Legazpi's troops when the, when, the, when, the, when the soldiers arrived in Manila. This is the Nuestra Señor de Caizasay, from the Albatangas. And this is the Nacional de Soledad. To the, to the left is the image in the Philippines. To the right is one of the Spanish prototypes on which it was most likely based. The story goes again that this image was found floating in Manila Bay and was brought to the port city of Cavite. Now, this image was stolen from the church, unfortunately. It was... Uh, and it was covered with silver when it was displayed for a very long time. All the silver was removed. Now, that's the unfortunate thing. The fortunate thing is, when they removed all the silver, they found a date. Okay? When the image was painted, it was 1692. So the image is not as mysterious after all. So, so there, is, there is a known date, there is a known provenance for, the, for this image now. Okay. Engravings we know were used as prototypes. Just, just, uh, just some listings there. Uh, the Doctrina Christiana, the 15, uh, 1595, Innocent the Ninth, the 1602, the first typographic press, it had images in it. And in 1610, we do know that the Jesuits distributed engravings of St. Ignatius and Francis Xavier uh, as part of the celebration. They serve as models for colonial work in the, this, uh, the same situation in Mexico. Okay. So you see motifs like uh, Renaissance strap work, Baroque curls and volutes, stylus, flowers, and tendrils. I'd like just to show you this page from a, from a European book that reached the Philippines. And this other one, these are, these are called vignettas, or they're space fillers. And you can see how very closely they resemble an image like this. You know, the flatness of, of the carving suggests that the model was probably a, a print. This is from the door of the church of, of Maragondon in uh, Cavite. Here is another image, again very flat, again most likely copied from an engraving uh, of an angel with Renaissance type strap work. This is from the church of Panay in Santa Monica in Capiz. The whole um, picture of iconography was learned from the, uh, from, from the Spanish and, uh, and uh, for example, the, the detail of, of the angels, they're always uh, depicted wearing the costume of the Roman centurion. They, they always have short skirts, and uh, they're all wearing boots. Uh, if you go to the USF show, you will see two, two angels uh, dressed almost like this. Now, this is St. Michael from the Philippines, and, and the uh, images in, in, um, in, uh, in the exhibit right now are from, from here, from the Americas. So there's, there's a unity, and this can only be explained by the fact that they, they were copying from some model, uh, a printed model most likely. Okay. Just very briefly, I'd like to show you a series of pictures from a, from a church just to give you a sense of, of uh, Philippine carving. This is from the church of Our Lady of the Can uh, Candelaria, Our Lady of Representation in Ceylon Cavite. This shows the Jesuit martyrs, St. Francis uh, Xavier, St. Francis Borgia, St. Aloysius Gonzaga, St. Stanislaus Koska. Look how Chinese they look. European saints looking very Chinese. And the figure of Jesus Christ. Uh, look closely at the face. It's kind of like a hybrid face. Uh, not completely European. Uh, but also notice the halo is the Baroque sun, which is, which is, which is very, a common motif. Okay. Here is the rest of the altar, as we, as we can see them. 
of the other, the other altar, the main altar of the church. And uh, this is the top of the altar, which shows you the Santo Nero de Tarnate. A, if you look very closely at the Christ child, uh, flanked by two saints, uh, Savior and Ignatius, the Christ child has an unusual knot on the top of his head. This is one of the characteristics of Philippine carving. Uh, the origins of it are debated by Philippine scholars. Some say it is really a takeoff from Montañez, uh, who, uh, who, who was a Spanish uh, car uh, carver of the Baroque. But some say, no, that's really Buddha's uh, knot on his head. Uh, I really don't know what the, the precise uh, origin is. It's, it's still a matter that has to be looked into. Yeah. Virgin Mary. All the elements here come straight out of European engravings including that canopied bed. Okay. Somebody has called that a mosquito net. But, you know, mosquito nets in the Philippines don't look like that. They're more squarish. And uh, um, here we see, like, the, the attempt of the carver probably to interpret a flat image. And it turns out that the image is sort of badly proportioned. The feet of the figures are, are just too big and too fat. Some little details, again, that, that probably points to an engraving. St. Joseph is way up there, j just beneath the star. He's lying down. Okay? That motif of St. Joseph uh, resting well, well, uh, uh, is found in, actually in, in even very early Byzantine iconography. And then this is the presentation. And then the ascension of Our Lady and her coronation. I am being signaled to go a little bit faster, so let me just show you some uh, bits and pieces of ivory because it's one of the nice things in the exhibit at USF. So ivory was a very important uh, article. Uh, that was, it was a luxury good. It was not as, it was not as heavily traded as uh, silk. Uh, but we do know that a lot of important ivory collections from the Philippines are not, in fact, in the Philippines, but they're elsewhere, like the Museo de Verenato in Tiposotlan, in Mexico, it was formerly the Jesuit uh, novitiate. It, the Royal Collection in Madrid, or the Augustinian Collection the, in the Museo Oriental in Valladolid. Ivory is not native to the Philippines. There are no elephants. So where did they get the ivory? It came to trade with the Chinese. The Chinese sourced the ivory mainly from Asia, although some African ivories have been recorded, uh, and then uh, brought to China by Arab traders. Ivory was relatively easy to carve as long as you carved along the grain, and this, in a sense, creates the aesthetic of Philippine ivory carving. So raw ivory was carved in the Chinese district of Manila, the Parian, by the 16th century. Then later on, in other places uh, in Manila, Santa Cruz, and Quiapo. Historians like to talk of the, especially Mexica, Mexican historians, like to talk of the 16th century pieces as Chino-Hispano, Whereas the 17th century, they want to call it Filipino-Hispano. And I think this is the recognition of the growth of a mixed breed of Mestizo class. So, uh, so Mestizo is uh, Filipino-Hispano is more of a chronological rather than a stylistic category. So eventually, the craft of ivory carving was passed on to native assistants. So the 19th century, the, the Ethnicity of the carver is no longer important, and in the 19th century, we begin to see more uh, uh, anatomically correct, if we mean anatomically correct, very close to, uh, to the European type. I'm, I'm seeing that my time is up, so let me just show you a few ivory pieces. Here's a very famous one, the Santo Rosario, a close-up of her face. So popular that there are copies of her. Here is a, a Madonna and Child. You can see the, the graceful curve, which is the curve of the ivory tusk. Even more pronounced in this, in this piece uh, of uh, St. Francis uh, of Assisi. The crucifix, usually made out of three pieces. St. Joseph, rather big head, you know, bad proportions. Very popular Santo Nino of Cebu. This is a Santo Nino that has a date, 1780. It belongs to the Augustinian order of Valladolid. And let me end with this, uh, a holy family, because there's something very similar that you will see in the, in the uh, exhibit at USF. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I'm sorry if I've gone a little bit over time. Uh, thank you.